You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Matt Migaki, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you've ever wanted to sneak backstage and share a beer with one of your favorite musicians, well, Vox and Hops is the podcast for you. This week on the podcast, I dropped a killer episode with Johannes Ekström of Avatar. There is this episode and over 440 other ones to help you enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. So what are you waiting for? It's time to become a Vox and Hops head. Cheers! Hello, hello, hello. Just a quick heads up on this episode. In case you didn't notice, it is marked with an E. Normally try to keep these things pretty squeaky clean, but as you know, we guitar players are a colorful people, and that is not always possible. I like to keep these as raw and natural as possible. I don't want to add in any beeps or squeaks or any other editing like that because it's, while comical, it is kind of annoying. So this is far from a gangster rap video, but you might not want to listen with your kids because there are a few choice words and things like that. So just a heads up, didn't want to catch anybody off guard. It is a very awesome episode, though, so... Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the ToneMob.com podcast. As always, I'm Blake Wylan, and today we are talking to Michael Adams of Mike and Mike's Guitar Bar. Michael is a yeah. luthier, musician, beardsman, and as Nel- Nels Klein knows him, the jazz master guy. Yes! <laughs> I love that. I love that. I'm sorry if uh, me going yes was screwing you up, but I'm really excited about that. Hey, not in the least. That was like the best thing that ever happened. <laughs> oh. That was pretty, that's that's just nuts. That is so cool. I can't even tell you. <laughs> it, it really was. Like, I, I didn't even know Wilco was playing in Seattle um, until I think two days before. And then Woody from Mastery Bridge texted me and said, hey, do you want to go to that show? And uh, of course I said yes. yes. Um, and he surprised me by getting me backstage and... Sending me a, an image of his text message with Nels, uh, where he asked if I could come, and yeah, uh, it was it was just amazing. It was amazing to be there. It was such a good show. But then going backstage and hanging out with Nels and um, getting to meet—I mean, admittedly, my biggest guitar hero right now. He's he has been such a huge influence and such a such a. Uh, like a, a point of excitement for me. I think I think his musicality and the way he approaches the instrument is just so damned exciting compared to uh, a lot of other guitar players on the market. And uh, I know it was just it was just a blast. It was a blast. I can't believe he knew who I was. I can't believe he uh, he freaking apologized to me for the uh, guitar issues he was having that night. His uh, his main jazz master kept going out of tune, and I knew exactly what was happening. I wanted to run up on stage and take care of it, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, he, uh, the minute I introduced myself, he went, oh, you're the jazz master guy. Woody said I need to talk to you. And uh, Man, that just, it put me completely at ease. I was so worried and so nervous to talk to him. And then he said that, and I was just, I, I don't know, put me in a good place where I was able to talk to him like a human being and not like, uh, you know, the object of my uh, greatest dreams and desires. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Please don't air that. Oh my god, that sounds horrible. I sound like I sound like the worst fanboy ever. I am. It's cool. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, you know, own it. Own it. I'm I'm owning it right now. I'm owning it as hard as I can. That's so good. But yeah, meeting him was great. I got to hang out and talk with him and uh and some of his relatives were there and I got to hear the story of how his I think great great grandfather was one of the founders of uh I think Georgetown, Washington. There's a there's a Klein Street apparently that runs through there, and that's named after their family. And uh, that was crazy. Um, yeah, I got to hear the story of how Impossible Germany came to oh, be, and, uh, and Nels uh, admitted that he never thought in his entire career he would have an iconic guitar song, and uh, um, it's very different apparently from what uh, the original idea was. He uh, intended it as uh, a musical homage to television the band and really yeah yeah which blew me away i couldn't believe that but uh 
but yeah, you said uh, it it changed a lot, and uh, and now here we are with this this ridiculous piece of music that uh, makes me feel alive every time I listen to it. It is it is the coolest piece of music ever. That guitar solo is one of the uh, one of the things that I probably play most often, even though I'm sure I play it really poorly uh, comparatively. But uh, yeah, that is. That was one of my favorite things ever. So, yeah, it was just a blast. Yeah. What a cool guy. It was such a, a coincidence because just the Sunday before that, so I was not going to the Wilco show. And one of my friends called me that morning and he says, hey, I'm I'm kind of sick. Um, You know the Wilco show? I'm like, e- yeah. And he's like, he's like, you want to you want my ticket? I'm like, um, Yeah. Because <laughs> oh, it was sold wow. out by the time I had finally got around to trying to get a ticket, and <laughs> and uh, you know I I'm not gonna lie I I'm like a I would consider myself a casual fan, you know I mm-hmm. uh, I I uh, listen to them on occasion, but I I you know the other guys in my band are super fans, so I went with them, nice. and then I I was like yeah this is gonna be great I'm gonna be scoping out gear because that's what I do at every show. And sure, me too. Yeah. And uh, it's gonna be so fun. And then I got rocked so hard. Just yep. my friend said it was almost funner to funner because that's a word more fun to watch me <laughs> than it was to watch the band because I was just rocking like out like I was at a metal show or Man. something because it was his, they were just killing it. And I was like, wow, I think I need to pay more attention to these guys because this just was e- yeah. epic. So, yeah, that was that's what they do. Uh, was great. That's what they do. Would you? Uh, what did you think of? Uh, I don't know if they did this at your show. At my show, they started out with the complete new album. They played it front to back and then launched into another set. Felt like a completely different band, um, but it was awesome. Did they? Did they do that for you? Yes, and actually, I, I did. I did know that was coming um, because oh. one of my uh, buddies I was with, he. Uh, did a little digging around on the old interwebs and and found out that that was kind of what their their uh, thing was was for the tour. So I thought that was pretty cool. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I really enjoyed that. So me too. You know, we could talk about Wilco forever, but but what we really need to talk about, yeah, because you're the guy of the hour today. Um, Aww. what I uh, I normally try to start off at some juncture and dig into. Um, your musical kind of backstory, like where did it start, and uh, oh, wow. you know where did it? Uh, yeah, basically, where did it start for you? That wow, that's really great. I'm I'm so excited to talk about that because when I the few interviews I've done have uh, you know uh, not that they can't go here, but it's mostly been like guitar tech stories or advice and things like that. And I love giving all that, but I you know, I don't really get asked about me very much. So thank you for bringing that up. That's great. Um, for me, uh, the musical journey started when I was 11. Uh, I remember my dad came into my room one day and decided that I was going to play a band instrument. And he said, what do you want to play? Um... Having just discovered MTV, I heard the word band, and I thought, guitar, of course. And that was a, uh, that was a major point of contention between us for quite some time. But uh, that Christmas, I, I got a guitar. I got a, like a three-quarter size Oscar Schmidt acoustic, and to me, it was the greatest thing in the world. Looking back, uh, that guitar definitely had a lot of issues. Um, I mean, the freaking strings were like a mile off the fretboard. It was impossible to play, but I struggled through it. Um, and it also just so happened that I watched Back to the Future every day during summer vacation from school. So, Very uh, nice. I, <laughs> yep. So Marty McFly is is my biggest guitar hero in the world. Uh, haven't met him yet, but uh, we'll get there. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I watched that every day. And just uh, by virtue of watching Michael J. Fox, uh, who was actually... He wasn't on the recording in the in the movie, but he was playing uh, the right notes, uh, albeit a half step, uh, I think a half step higher than what they should have been. I think he says blues riff in B, but it's actually in B flat. <laughs> oh, that's um, right. <laughs> which I discovered by learning from watching the damn thing and being like, this doesn't sound right. 
Uh, but yeah, I learned Johnny Be Good, and my parents were so impressed. Uh, God bless them that they bought me an electric guitar the next year, and uh, I started out on a what was it? It was an Ibanez Silver Cadet, the kind of guitar that you buy in a package with a little amp. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was my first electric guitar, and from then on, being too loud has been my greatest joy uh, in the world. I discovered, uh, you know, Radiohead. I discovered I was a really big Bush fan back in high school. Um, that first album kills. I still listen to Sixteen Stone, and I feel like, oh, it was really good. I don't really have any other comments about it, but oh man, that was really good. <laughs> um, Weezer has always been a huge thing for me. Really? So I listen oh, to that's, that music. that's news oh, to me. I didn't know you liked Weezer. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> You're being sarcastic, I think. Not me. No, uh, I don't do that. <laughs> You're being very sarcastic. Okay, I... um, no, Weezer's definitely a huge thing for me and always was. Um, God, what else? What else really influenced me? Um, I loved uh, Walk This Way by Aerosmith. Loved that song. But, Absolutely couldn't get enough of that song. I still like that um, song. Oh, man. Yeah, dude, that was a great era mm-hmm. for uh, Aerosmith. Era Smith. Um, yeah, so just learning all of those things and figuring it out as I go. Unfortunately, I my family is amazing and I love them uh, to death. But I, unbeknownst to all of us, I had a bunch of uh, learning disabilities that no one quite knew about. Um, so when it came to taking lessons, I was a horrible student and I still wish that I would have, I would have had some inkling that I didn't learn the way that most other people did. So when I was given a lesson, it was incredibly difficult for me not to not get distracted or to even complete it. Um, and to this day, things like math equations, notes on a page, um, they all run together for me. Nothing really looks right when I look at that. I can I can work on guitars. I can resolder. I can do neck resets. I can do all of these things. I can play my heart out, but I I cannot make uh, written music make any sense to me. I try and learn uh, once a year, probably. I try. I give it a real push every year to really try and learn how to how to sight read. And it usually ends with me being like utterly dejected, <laughs> like uh, just like I'll never be good at this. So, yeah. So lessons were really difficult for me. I learned almost entirely by ear, and uh, and that has served me well. I can kind of jump into most musical situations and feel good about it. Um, but when someone puts a sheet of music in front of me, it's uh, it is the worst thing. I, <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, I think I think what they call that. I think there's a name for that, and I think it's called being a guitar player. But... Oh yeah, no, I'm sure. <laughs> I've heard that many a time. Uh, no, I have. I have a clinical reason for that. So yeah. Oh well, I, I, I have a little bit, a uh, little bit more of a serious uh, privilege there than uh, regular guitar oh, players. Oh well. Huh. Oh no, man, I'm not an idiot. I just, I just can't. Here's why. <laughs> here's the thing. Here's the printout the doctor gave me. Man, I don't, I don't <laughs> know if I qualify for those or not, but. I gotta fit. You gotta go to a doctor. I don't know if you've been to a doctor, but they are very uh, cool. Well, they're very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they just you check that out. They're always trying to give me stuff. <laughs> I don't understand. It's like I'm like I have something wrong with me. I don't understand what they're doing. What pills? Well, yeah. Do they give you pills, brother? Let me tell you, <laughs> those are great. Oh, mama. <laughs> no, I do not. I do not currently endorse any drugs. Uh, <laughs> so. Well, you can you Ugh. can trade them, I think, for like fuzz pedals. So that's really not so bad. Wait, is there is there a pills fuzz pedal trading market that I'm unaware? Well, of? I mean, I'm sure that you could come up, you could probably trade them to that guy on the corner, and then you know he would probably give you some some Benjamins. What, and... Dave? Dave, who just stands at the corner all day? Yeah. is that what he's doing? Th- that's out what there? he's doing out there. Yeah, he he. Oh, wow, I've talked to that guy a thousand times. He never brings up the whole pedal for. For pills. Well, well, it's pedals for pills. That sounds almost like a charity, <laughs> a weird ass charity. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Wow. All right. Well. Yep. Guess what's gonna. Sorry for getting off the rails. There. Oh, that's what happens. So that's that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so what will be happening is when I do a uh, a post on Instagram uh, telling everyone about this episode, there will be a hashtag pedals for pills. So everyone will be wondering pedals, what... pedals for pills. Yeah. They're not going to know. What I, I will promote the heck out of that too. And everyone will still be confused. Oh, very, very, but that's fine. 
So yeah. Well, but I, what about you? How did you how did you start with the instrument? Oh well, um, let's see. My my dad was a guitar player. Um, he hmm. I so I grew up watching him play guitar and going, sure would be cool if I could do that. And then um, hmm. I my mother asked me if I would like to take uh, uh, piano lessons, and I was like. Yeah, that hmm. seems pretty cool because uh, my grandpa played piano and I always watched him play. Oh wow! And so I was like, "Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I should learn how to do that." And I I started playing the piano and I played for I took lessons for about three years or so when I was between like nine and and twelve or something. And then I kept hmm. bringing various rock songs to learn, but they weren't really piano rock songs, <laughs> you know, like sure. Uh, you know, it was more like just standard, like radio rock stuff. Like, I think I actually brought my, I actually, if I'm remembering correctly, I think I brought my, uh, guitar teacher, my, excuse me, my piano teacher, a Weezer song. I don't remember which one it was. And she's like, well, this, and I, that, I don't remember if it was that one or if it was a different song. And she's like, you know, I've noticed that maybe you should, um, look at learning the guitar. And I, and really, yeah. And I was like, and she was teaching both me and my sister. And I was, she's like, well, everything you bring me is guitar based. Um, hmm. And I'm like, well, I do want to. I would love to know how to play the guitar. Um, so I promptly um, took my guitar player's friend friend's advice and started trying to learn the drums. Um, hmm. And that was a disaster. And oh. oh, it was it was bad. I'm a better drummer now than I was when I was actually trying to play the drums. It was <laughs> it was just terrible. Um, and then I I finally just um, somehow there was this there was an old Takamini from the 70s uh, that was in my family, and it was kind of moving mm. from house to house. Um, I don't. I'm not sure why it's like somebody would think they wanted to play guitar and then it would go to somebody else's house and then hmm. it would sit there for a while. Anyway, it ended up at my parents' house. Well, dad already had a couple guitars, but he didn't really want me to learn on his guitars because they were, you know, halfway decent guitars. So, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, but this Takamini was actually just as nice, but it wasn't his. So it, uh, I started, started learning on that and I, uh, I think the first song I really remember like figuring out by myself was uh, "Smells Like Teen Spirit." I believe. Hell yeah! Hell yeah! So, uh, and then from there, I started playing in bands, um, or I should say, a band, um, and really focused on like, like hardcore and 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 like a little bit of the metalcore stuff because that's what was really big at the time. Wow. What year and, was this? Uh, in the early two thousands. Yep, it yep. was hardcore central back then. And uh, I still like some of that stuff, but it's definitely not my main thing anymore. Um, yeah, I agree with that. I feel like, like uh, even even the early the early nineties, early or mid nineties, early two thousands, like emo was amazing music. Like Get Up Kids and Promise Ring, all of these bands. And then the genre became so, uh, what's the word, routine. Uh, Mm -hmm. Everyone was doing the same exact thing. Everyone wanted to sound like Mineral. And I only wanted Mineral to sound like that. So the genre became very boring to me after a certain time. Uh, I was in in a band called Grandview that was, uh, we were called the classic rock of emo at one point because we took like our favorite guitar parts from like Thin Lizzy and we adapted things like that into the genre and it worked really well unfortunately it broke up but then i went from that into hardcore music myself i was in a hardcore band called the art of abandonment in central pennsylvania and it was god like that that music may not be my main jam anymore but i mean the intensity the mm-hmm. uh the 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 emotional just like release of being in a hardcore band was it's still one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had a musician, of which I, I could tell you about 10. And some of those are from playing with that band. Just It was a style of music I had never gotten into before. But, I mean, I learned so much over, you know, half a year that I got to stand in for them. Um, yeah, yeah. That, oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah, it's it's. I still will put in, usually it's 
usually it's bands from that era if I'm feeling that kind of that kind of thing. Um, but like my number one favorite band, and I would probably credit them with uh, helping my musical tastes evolve, is uh, Thrice. And hell yeah, I've always been such a huge fan of them. And you know, I first got into them because I liked their heavy stuff. And then when they changed, when Visu came out, I was like, mm-hmm. this is mind blowing. And then they just kept going and getting better. <laughs> and it was like, I still, they're still my favorite band. And that's about the only group from that era that I still feel really strongly. Like I love Hell that yeah. band. Thrice <laughs> was amazing. Uh, the album called, uh, correct me if I have the title wrong, Artist in the Ambulance. Yep. Yeah, that thing changed my life. That was, I mean, when I was like really like figuring out this music, that was one of those things that I, I just listened to all the damn time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, that band was incredible. I remember when I got the, uh, was it the second disc of the Alchemy Index that was oh. Water? Yes. That, it was a complete departure from their normal sound, but wow, the mm-hmm. songs were so amazing. Like, I, I I wasn't one of those guys who was like snobby. Oh, this isn't hardcore enough. But like, I mean, wow, what what a what a left turn for them, and how fantastic! Like, um, that one. Uh, oh, what the hell is that song called? The one. Uh, uh, uh the one about Davy Jones' locker. Oh, oh man, uh, it's like the second track. Um, I, I'm singing it in my head right now. Yeah. Davey I'm starting Jones. to, yeah, God. believe the oceans much like you. What is that song? Atlantic. It's called Atlantic. Yes. Yeah. Holy mm-hmm. crap. That is still one mm-hmm. of those songs that I look to. When I think of a piece of music that has like, I'm going to go off on a tangent here, but music, so much of it anymore doesn't seem to have uh, like a setting or or a story or characters, things like that. I remember Tom Waits has a quote that, that's something like, uh, you know, uh, a song needs a song needs a setting. It needs a story. It needs a protagonist. It needs it needs uh, your your aunt's golf clubs. It needs a, a car trunk. It needs things like that. Um, and one of one of those songs, I know I didn't have that quote completely right, but there's something in there that I thought was really true. And thinking about Atlantic as a song. I listen to that and I am immediately in a different environment. Just like a good mm-hmm. movie takes you out of whatever whatever you're in the middle of and puts you in a different uh, place entirely. Like we saw Mad Max for the first time last night. Fury Road. Uh, didn't get nice. into it until just now. And last night my wife and I saw it. And yeah, immediately, as soon as that movie started, I was, I was there in post-apocalyptic Australia. I was there. Uh, that song, Atlantic, definitely does that same thing. I cannot separate myself from what's happening in the exposition of that song. Beautiful writing, amazing. Well done, Thrice. Well oh, done. Oh yes. I mean, I mean, I'm the yeah, I'm the right guy to fanboy out on Thrice stuff because <laughs> it's Heck yeah. You you were getting creepy with with Nels. I I get creepy with Dustin <laughs> and the boys like no one's business because it's. It's pretty bad. I've seen them every time they've came to Portland since, um, I don't know, since the early 2000s. I've been there every nice. time. Nice. Uh, met them a couple times. You know, it. I don't. I doubt they remember me. I was probably just a sweaty like, ah, yeah. what's going on? But uh, <laughs> it. it uh, yeah, those guys. I have all their albums except for the original. You know, the first one that they kind of purposely buried because apparently they really didn't like it. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was like their. Uh, it was called First Impressions, and they that I've never been able to find a copy of it, um, but wow. I will buy one if I find it. And but they they don't talk very highly of that it at all. That is a super so. on the nose album title too. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad I've never heard of that until just now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very uncharacteristic of how they they normally do things. Well, but, I mean, uh, I mean, thinking about it, going from that album, I forget uh, was was Artist their second album or was it? Um... No, that's 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 their second. Yeah, that is their second out. Al- well, that's their second. First impressions well, is their official first one, but the one they really let people know about is Identity Crisis is the first one. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Well, well, still just a huge ramp up in terms of like songwriting prowess and you know lyrical fortitude things. Yeah, huge, huge ramp up between that album and 
and uh, Artists in the Ambulance. Still, oh God, yeah, what an amazing band. Yeah, there's a, one of my biggest memories um, is from me and my whole band being at a a thrice show and them they were playing uh, Under a Killing Moon, and we were all in, in the mosh pit together Jeez. at the same time, and we we all turned around and and was all looking at each other right on the the last breakdown where mm. he's he says it and watch the witches burn and then we all just like we were all in the middle at the same time and then we all just came apart at that moment and just wow. and just tore the place apart and it Man. was <laughs> you want to talk about powerful that was one of my big moments uh, and it was it was nuts music is the greatest uh it really it is, is the greatest thing that we have i think as a as a as a race that connects, you know, across, you know, social, socioeconomic uh, barriers, language barriers, all of that. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. It brings it brings people together. It really does. It sounds cheesy, but it it's the truth. I mean, it does. Going to a show, like even uh, even when I lived in Europe for a long time, going to shows in in languages I didn't quite understand, like still, you felt connected. You feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. It doesn't matter you know, where you come from, who you are, all these things. Music is such a powerful force. Man, I've got I've got similar memories like what you just described from going to Zayo shows back in the day. Do you remember that? Oh band? yeah. Oh yes. That is still to this day one of the greatest heavy bands I've ever heard or had the chance to see live. Uh one of my bands got to play a show with them once and it was it I I can't even really think of words to describe it. They were behemoths on stage. They were, <laughs> they were, I mean, oracles. They were, they were, they were such a force. They were loud. They were powerful. One of the first bands I ever heard that really down tuned. And, uh, geez, man, the music they made, like Liberate Te Ex and Ferris, is still one of my like favorite heavy records to spin. <sighs> man. Damn. That's a band, yeah. That's a band I need to uh, probably explore a little more. I remember them from then, but I I didn't really give them a fair shake. I would say. Um, oh man, bro! I gotta check. I gotta, I gotta check that out. <laughs> gotta check that out, dude. I will, bro, I will dude, email bro. you links if you need to. Like, got and that the record that I mentioned, Liberate, is uh, chock full of uh, sound clips from uh, Event Horizon. Do you remember that movie? Oh really? Oh yeah. okay. Wait, this is all sounding very familiar. Maybe I did listen to that album. Yeah, and or I read about it. Oh, it is perfect. It is it's at, at at the same time the one of the heaviest records I've ever heard, and also one of the scariest because that movie is also one of my favorite horror sci-fi films. And just man, what an album! What an album! It's ah. a serious trip. Ah, so good. So let's see if we can get get into gear a little yeah, bit. Yeah, let's do it. Because do it. because I think I think this might be an interesting segue because we've been talking about heavy bands. Um I have personally been doing strange setups or not strange I guess but sort of non-traditional heavy guitar setups lately. Oh, interesting. Um just and I'm finding that I really like it uh better than like I'm like my go-to lately when I'm playing heavy songs or riffs um, mostly because I'm working on this like stoner nerd metal project right now. <laughs> nice, love yeah. it, love it. Uh, it's been my uh, Rickenbacker 360. Love um, that with uh, high gains in it. You know the high mm-hmm. gain single mm-hmm. coils, and then um uh and tuned to C or D. <gasps> and through what? Through what amp? Through what pedals? Tell me this. Okay, well, lately it's my my go to amp is well. Here you go. You want to talk about not being a traditional heavy amp at all? <laughs> it's 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 been my uh my uh Chris's Monarch actually that fifteen watt. Whoa, yeah. man! Can I just take a moment to say that Chris Benson builds some of the finest amps I have ever played. If I had any money, it would go into a Monarch or even to like a custom build with like sixty five fifties. I don't know. His amps are so exciting. I love the, that guy. Yeah, he's super cool. And this is, uh, well, we're going to keep the ball rolling because um, this is the, he's been on uh, mentioned or in every episode so far. So What? <laughs> Chris, if you're listening, I love you. I love you and I want your stuff. And uh, I will promote the hell out of it 
because I just realized I don't do that enough. So I'm sorry, Chris. <laughs> Actually, Chris yeah. was at the Wilco show too, and we hung out for ages talking about gear and talking about tubes that we like. And yeah, that guy. I feel bad too because I didn't remember what he looked like. I I'm so bad when I have customers like. Again, I meant I bring up learning disabilities. I I'm so bad with faces, but I I literally never forget a guitar or an amp that I've worked on. <laughs> right. I have them all in my mind, like a sort of uh, sort of uh, like item OCD. I've got I've got a photographic memory for those things. So when I met Chris at the Wilco show, granted he grew a beard since the last yes, time I did. saw him, did yes, not did. recognize him at all, and he was like, "Hey man, good to see you. It's Chris." And I went, "Chris, I know you from." And he went, you, you sell my amps, I'm Chris Benson. I felt horrible. I felt so bad. So he, he, he's a good guy. He didn't, it didn't hurt his feelings. It didn't. No. He, we, we, we made up quick and then, you know, we were talking about beer or whatever. But still, I'm sorry, Chris. If you're listening, I'm sorry. Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, while you were hanging out with him at the Wilco show, I was texting him trying to see if we could get together and record an episode. Um, oh, did you do an episode with him? I did. He was uh, on episode two. Yes. What? Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna have to go back and listen to that. That's rad. Yeah, he was on episode two. We went to his house and uh, it and we uh, uh, hung out and we he told me a bunch of stuff that I didn't know. And <laughs> I love that. I love being able to connect with people like that that can just like open up. I mean, like I'm uh, like you use my nickname, the Jazz Master guy, and I only found out that I had that recently. It is a huge honor, but I still have so much to learn. Like the like there is never enough to take in, and so I'm re like people like Chris. We we talked about the virtues of KT eighty eight. It's over my favorite tube, which is sixty five fifty. He doesn't think there is cool. I think KT88s are fine, but I love 6550s. But I got to hear his his thoughts on the way they work, the way they sound, and it just blew my mind wide open. It felt great. I felt like um like my brain just had a big meal. You know that feeling when you when you you figure something out and your brain has this this rush of endorphins and you feel like oh I'm I am a golden god I am you know <laughs> that kind of thing. I had that yeah. just from talking to him. He was the greatest. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, he's he's good time. So that is yeah, well, I mean, I think why it gets brought up is cuz if you ever are on my Instagram page, you'll notice I'm kind of a fan and I got yes, other stuff that he, I got <laughs> I've got other stuff that he's uh that he's kind of worked on and I've known him for for several years, you know, but everyone has kind of heard that story that's listened to these. So, mm -hmm. um anyway, that back to the heavy rig. Uh, yeah, I, I, I run that Monarch because I pretty much always play that, even though I have other amps, that's just what I normally plug into. Uh, and then it depends on my mood and what I'm exactly trying to do, but I'm running, um, various fuzzes. I got, I, well, I, I don't know how many fuzzes I have at this point, but <laughs> uh, lately it's been the Death by Audio Fuzz War. Um, oh, what a pedal. Yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes mashed up with a um, a uh, transition era black box big muff, which is essentially Ooh. just a bubble font big muff yep. in a different box. So. That's serious stuff too. Have you tried the uh, the rust box? I have not. Who makes oh. that one? Oh god. Um, I will look it up later. I I can't remember the name. Uh, but the, I think it's called the rust box, right? Yeah. It's this, uh, this company that makes what I understand to be a sun preamp. Ooh, I think that's, please don't quote me on that. I am not sure. I've only played it once and it, it was amazing. And my buddy Michael brought it over to the shop one day and I spent a whole afternoon just, I mean, like I was too loud. I was tuning down. I was playing whatever sun riffs I knew. Uh, but yeah, it was it was an incredible pedal, and that is totally worth your time if you're into. You mentioned stoner metal. I think maybe you should check that pedal out, or maybe it's I'm called. Gonna... Is it called the Rust Box or the Boxidizer? God, now I can't remember. I'll I'll email you later. I will I will double check my facts on that. I have a All picture right. of it somewhere. I'm highly intrigued. Um, yeah, I'm not what you would. I'm not like a. I'm just getting into that stoner doom stuff. Like I'm super, like a super neophyte as far as like learning about all those bands, but I just, I love the guitar sound that those bands get. I just love it. I, I personally can't 
really sit through the whole song usually because they're so long. <laughs> they're so and, I, and I just lost all my doom metal guys that listen to this. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you they, can't make a statement in under three minutes, then I don't want to hear it. I'm that's right. done. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I just I usually I'm like, man, that that guitar sounds so heavy. I love it. Mm-hmm. Okay, next song. I got to hear what they did on this one. Because <laughs> I, uh, but anyway, that's all right, man. I mean, like I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that genre too. But like, yeah, I mean, sometimes I, I, you know, I don't have time for, for an eight and a half minute epic song or a fifteen minute dirge. Like, it's great stuff. Yeah, it's not every day for me. But that's you know, I don't live and breathe that genre like I do others. So eh, whatever, right? It's fine. It's all yeah. cool. I am. So anyway, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm I wanted to get your opinion your on that. Oh, I'm excited uh, yeah. by your rig because uh, when I was when I was doing hardcore music, I found that like the ubiquitous PV fifty one fifty, or yeah fifty one fifty yeah or the sixty five oh five. That's what I was thinking of. But mm-hmm. those you know I saw those amps more than anything. I saw Mushroom Cabs, I saw Jackson Soloists, and I saw like Les Pauls. And when I when I played that music, uh, I was either using a Les Paul or I. There were a couple times. Where I found out, I have the 77 uh, Gibson ES355, and everyone complains, oh, semi-hollow body, just feedback, whatever. I do not have that problem with my guitars. I don't know if it's the way I set it up or the way I work on them. But I found that having a hollow body instrument uh, filled out the frequency range on my guitar, uh, no matter what amp I was using, uh, in a way that was pleasing and set me in a completely different realm than the other guitar player. So every time I play really heavy music, I think that's the first instrument I reach for anymore is it's got two humbuckers, but they're not high output. They're like seven, seven point five K at the, at the strongest. And they're like, they're from the seventies. So they're deteriorating. The magnets are losing a little bit of their, their charge. So I don't know. There's this sound that I get with a 355 or 335 style that you just don't hear in that music. There's, there's an airiness to the mid range that I really like. And and so I, f- I feel like it's great to experiment. You're using a Rick in that kind of music. That blows my mind, and I bet it sounds wildly good. I bet it sounds effervescent, even, if, you, if I could use that term for that yes, kind of can. music. But, uh, <laughs> well, I just did, so uh, uh-huh. edit it out or uh, leave it alone. Nope. I don't care, bro. <laughs> um, it's, it's staying, man. It's staying. <laughs> so you're, what amp are you using? You're using Benson Amp. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're using a, Marna, a Monarch for that. I, I'm a big 1970s Marshall JMP guy. Those have always been my favorite Marshalls. Back in high school, I didn't have the money to do this, but I, don't, I, I honestly have no idea how I made this happen. But I started on a JCM 2000 DSL, which I loved. And then I went backward through the Marshall catalog. And I bought, I think, almost every head they ever made trying to find the sound in my head but i never had them all at the same time i would sell one and get another like i went back through the jcm 800 uh, dual reverb then i went to the jcm 800 uh single channel with the uh it was the 20 uh, i forget the model name but it was the slx head that was the slx head and i had that and i loved it but it had a little too much top end and i thought oh i'll go back a little farther got a um, I got a 76 JMP that blew my mind, uh, sounded like every ACDC recording I had, did not have a lot of gain on tap, but that was an amazing amp. And then I, I should never have done this, but I sold it, and then I bought a, a brown face JCM, uh, JCM 800 uh, dual input, the, um, the horizontal input, not the vertical. Uh, oh, okay. So that was the yep. circuit board one that everyone complains about, but I clipped one of the bright caps and put 6550s in, and it was the loudest, heaviest sounding amp I've ever owned. That thing was amazing. And then I sold that, and I got a couple more Marshall heads that escape me right now. And then I landed back on a 79 JMP with 6550s, 50 watt. Uh, I will not... I will not get rid of that amp for anything in the world. That amp is the end-all, be-all of Marshall heads to me. Um, and it's because it is, it is articulate. It is, it is fantastic even with the gain rolled off. Like, as a clean amp, it is unsurpassed. And if I run pedals into it, it takes pedals like a champ. Like, I remember the first time I plugged my full-tone OCD into that amp, set clean. Uh, glorious sound. 
And then I thought, oh, I wonder what the gain sounds like on its own. Guess what? Another glorious sound. Unbelievable. Loud, low end. Um, the original Transformers are just heavy as hell. And uh, I don't know. I feel like this thing is bulletproof. And those are, those are absolutely always my favorite amps. The 2204 with 6550s. Best amp I ever used. So those amps with a semi-hollow like my 355 oh god i got i got some sounds in there uh that i just i just don't think are fit for human consumption like they're <laughs> they're heavenly i love them so it, oh, man that 355 i've i've seen your, that pictures and it makes me drool oh uh, it, it is I'm so like, cool like, that is such thank a you bb king and ryan adams for convincing me that i needed a guitar like that it was pretty much i mean i always loved bb king but when when I discovered that Ryan Adams was using an early '70s 355, I immediately went on the search for mine back in 2007, something like that. And I found this guitar. It's got the uh, the Gibson Maestro uh, Liar Vibrola. Sorry, Liar Vibrola. And again, it's another one of those things that everyone complains about. I guess it's the way I work on guitars because I cannot make that thing go out of tune. It's it's all about setup. It's about using appropriate gauge strings. Um, to counteract the tension of the spring. And here's a tip for your listeners, chapstick. Fucking chapstick. 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 Literally the best string lubricant I have ever found. I have tried everything. I used to use the uh, Big Ben's nut sauce, and that stuff's great too. Uh, You know, it's hard to say with a straight face, but that stuff is great. (laughs) I have no problem with that product. But I ran out, and I thought... Uh, chapstick is kind of the same, I wonder. And guess what? It's it's amazing. It is the greatest thing you can do. You get like a little a tube of it for a buck, and then you get a couple Q-tips. Just lubricate up the Q-tips, run it in the saddles, run it in the nut slots. Bam. Absolutely Whoa. stable tuning. I do that to all of my guitars, my Jazz Masters, my 355, my Bass 6. Everything gets that. Um, Thank you so much for that, because I was just about to go buy some some... I don't didn't have a brand in mind, but I was gonna get some special nut lube because my junior has a sticky G string. That happens. That happens. Yeah. And I was like, well, I need to lube it up. Um, I'm gonna yeah. try chapstick. <laughs> try chapstick, or uh, you know what I find? Uh, you may your mileage may vary. I I tend to buy the slightly softer Burt's Bees stuff. There's there's mm-hmm. a certain thing that they make that's all it's a little creamy. That's what I use really, but chapstick is gonna work just fine. I'd also recommend not getting like the flavored chapstick because then your guitar is gonna smell weird. And I haven't had good experiences with that mixing with lots of sweat. So aha. Uh-huh. So the original is a good flavor. But hey, you know, if you want almond butter on your guitar, I do not care. It's not gonna make a difference for me. Or cherry. Cherry's very cherry. good. Cherry cherry would be nice i mean you know when you're (laughs) you're doing like uh i don't know like you're playing with your tongue like kiss or something and then you can get a little flavor instead of just steel you know maybe you're doing a Jimi hendrix uh tooth thing in the dead of winter and you're thinking oh man i'm i'm really ripping this solo but damn my lips are broken up a little bit like oh Mm -hmm. man i really need to moisture oh wait there's the bridge and you just you just lube up you're gonna be good you're going to be good through the rest of that set. You may even be good for the rest of the night, but that's barring any, uh, you know, uh, what, whatever, whatever you call, call them incidents. incidents. Yeah. Let's call them yeah. incidents with, uh, yeah. with uh, very, very motivated fans or whatever, if that's, that's your right. bag. It is not my bag because I'm happily married, but it could be your bag. And That's right. Hey, and we're man, here to help you. That's, that's all right with about. me, man. You do you. I'm on watch. <laughs> I'm on nod. That's all right. <laughs> That's all right, baby. Yeah. Uh, that was exceedingly weird. I that, that so was. Sorry. I wonder if that's enough to warrant a, an iTunes explicit or not. Oh, I did say the up. F word. I'm sorry. Was I not oh. supposed to swear on this? Can I swear on this? I'm sorry. You, you can swear a little bit. I try to keep it. I, I was trying to avoid the, the explicit on this one, but oh, uh, yeah, most of well, them. well, uh, but you know, I can probably people. edit that, edit that F bomb out and get, and get it, get it through the censors. I'm think. sorry. You know, we were going to do this weeks ago and I think you mentioned that to me and I completely forgot and I'm sorry. That's hey okay. listeners, I apologize. My potty mouth. <laughs> I, I just can't do a thing with it. I'm sorry. It, well, you know, we, we are guitar players. It's, you know, we're mm. not. We you know we can only be expected to have such, such, um, you know we got a narrow vocabulary. Okay, we so, are but... a very crass group of people. I'll admit it. 
I'm the worst of them all. I I I don't believe that. Thank um, you. That's great for my <laughs> self esteem. I appreciate that. I I I'm because. I know some people. Let's just put it that way. You know some, some people. I, I know who are some no people. strangers to the swearing biz. If right. you catch the drift, they were they are journeymen <laughs> in that they've been in the trade for a long time. <laughs> they they apprenticed under some masters, and now they are the masters. So I, in my swearing travels or travails, let's call them. I right. uh, I once apprenticed with a, a Central Pennsylvania native. Uh, we called him Foul Mouth Jim. Uh, he was known throughout the central Pennsylvania area as having, uh, believe it or not, the foulest of mouths. And uh, I like to think of myself as living up to that legacy just a little bit, <laughs> one day at a time. Right. Well, Foul we all have to gym. have goals, right? You know, we have to. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> For phenomenal. the record, I, I made that character up. That's not a real person that I know of. Um, sorry, well, Central I, PA. I wish it was. Cause I wish it I, was, too. Ah, man. I read a book. <laughs> we'll work on that together. I think we can make this. We can make this a thing. Good old foul mouth Jim. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a children's book. Oh, with there you go. A lot of asterisks in it. Yes, no one. No, they will say, "Why are there so many stars in this book, Dad?" And it's a book about not swearing. Angry yeah. parents, stop suing us. Stop boycotting our book. Maybe read it before That's... you boycott. There you go. <laughs> oh man. <sighs> Where have we gone? Sorry, we were talking about gear and weird setups. Yeah, well, I yeah, we were. I think we got that covered. Mm. I was specifically talking about heavy heavy music setups. So heavy music. What I, one thing I really wanted, to, I actually genuinely planned on asking you this. Oh, fantastic. Um, so, obviously, you are the Jazz Master guy, as we've spoke about. How <laughs> and... I mean, what made what drew you to that particular instrument? Because I've got a desire for one like no one's business, oh, but man. I haven't got to snag one yet. Anyway, that's not the point of this. Point is, what got you to be the jazz master guy? Well, it, it was a number of things. Uh, when I moved out to Seattle in 2010, I didn't own one, um, but I, I met the the other Mike, Mike Ball from Mike and Mike's Guitar Bar. Um, my partner in crime, my one of my best friends ever, and he he had one. He had a, a jazz master and a jaguar, and I remember playing it and just thinking, "Oh my god, this is the best guitar I've ever played." Um, and even though it had it had some of the setup issues that most people complain about, you know, string slippage, all of that, um, I I eventually bought it from him. It's a Thin Skin 2007 uh, in Sonic Blue, amazing guitar. Um, Really, my one of my main guitars since I bought it. So I eventually bought that from him, and I went through it, and I looked at all the issues that people complain about. I saw all those forum posts, and I said, like, no, none of this makes sense. I said, Leo Fender was a genius, and he designed some of the greatest, most enduring guitar legacies that we have today. The instruments he made, people are still talking about like they are um, a gift from God himself. And so I thought, there's no reason that Fender would have put out a guitar that is flawed that egregiously. There's no way that this, this would have made it past the design stage if it didn't actually work. So then I started digging in and I started figuring out the solutions or, or rather the prescriptions for all of these problems that people were having. I looked at uh, Leo Fender's patent drawings. I looked at things like uh, complaints on forums about the original bridge and then thinking like, okay, what was the original intention here? And very quickly I realized that <laughs> As I, I had a little Twitter rant the other day about this, but I figured out that just like Einstein was an absolute genius, his brain is, is one that we should all be thankful for. I certainly don't understand everything that he said. I don't understand the concepts or the formulas, uh, but I respect and admire his work. And in the same way, uh, maybe it's, it's disingenuous to compare Leo and Einstein, but in the same way, Leo designed a guitar that is fantastic, and I realized that maybe it's a little bit above me. And so I started studying. I just started tinkering with it. Um, and I started looking at his intentions for the instrument, which is even, even crazier. He, he designed the Jazz Master in 57, uh, along with George Fullerton and Freddie Tavares, and they designed the Jazz Master as a guitar for jazz players. Leo looked at the archtop guitars that were so prevalent and still are so prevalent in that style of music 
and he wanted to build a solid body that would kind of fill those same knees, which is why we have the extra dark rhythm circuit uh, up top, which singles out the neck pickup and makes it really dark. And that's because that was the jazz sound. He designed the guitar for use with 12 gauge flat wound strings, uh, which is why a lot of people are having issues with their bridges is because the strings aren't heavy enough. So being a guy that uses 11 gauge round wounds, I thought, okay, I'll probably be all right. But then I thought about uh, the geometry of jazz guitars, the arch top. There's a tailpiece, the strings go over essentially a floating bridge at a very steep angle, and then they move on to the fingerboard. And I thought, yeah, okay, these are supposed to have shims. This neck angle is supposed to be pitched back a good bit. And so the minute I installed uh, what I assumed to be a correct amount of shims with the original bridge with 11 gauge strings, all of a sudden, the guitar started working perfectly. Every single complaint that I've ever seen, even with the reissue Fender Bridge, just gone. Uh, and I thought, oh my God, this is a genius guitar. I'm gonna really, I'm gonna really figure this out. I'm gonna play this. I'm gonna make sure I know this guitar inside and out. So I went uh, through all the requisite mods, like switching out the original Fender pickups for Lawler's Jazzmaster set, doing some electronics fun. Uh, and once I had the original bridge figured out, uh, I, I moved on to a mastery bridge because I just, I love the way it sounds. I love the way it feels. Um, you know, I don't know if that makes sense as a story, but that, that was kind of my process with the guitar. I decided that I wasn't just going to take complaints at face value anymore. I was going to really dig into the instrument. And I feel like I came out on the other side just with an even deeper respect for the model and the design around it. I... It gets it gets a little <laughs> difficult sometimes for me to hear. Like some people, I was at a bar a while ago, and the guy said, "Oh, what's your favorite guitar?" And I said, "Jazzmaster." And he goes, "They don't stay in tune." And I was like, "No, they do, brother. Let me oh, let me waste your time for a minute." <laughs> and I just went <laughs> off. I was like, "No, they stay in perfect tune." Here's why. Uh, or uh, what was it? The other day, I posted something on Instagram about the original bridge again and how perfect it is and how it works and how, yes, I love Mastery Bridge, but at the same time, like, you can get the original bridge to work. And immediately I got a flood of comments like, no, it's impossible. You can't make them work. And I was like, oh, great. Well, here's a 65 Jazz Master that has the original bridge that works amazingly. Like, you know, it just took, it just took a little work. And so I, I don't, I hope that when people listen to this, they don't think I'm coming off as a huge arrogant dick because I, I'm sorry, arrogant jerk. Damn it. <laughs> there goes that explicit uh, rating. <laughs> um, but I hope, I hope I'm not coming off like that because I'm just, I'm still every day so excited about this design and, uh, for, for lack of a better word, I feel like I'm kind of an evangelist for the, the model because they are so misunderstood. Jazzmasters and Jaguars have had a bad rap for about 50 years after they were designed. I think it was like 2008 when people started really getting back into them again. Thanks in part to Nels Klein. Thanks in part to the Mastery Bridge. Um... And I think, I don't know, I feel like, uh, maybe this is lofty, but I have this responsibility. And I, I feel like Leo and Fullerton and Tavares stumbled on something great, and we just didn't recognize it. We just didn't get what it was. And, uh, and so techs sometimes, and I'm guilty of this too. I remember my first Jaguar was uh, one that I had in high school in 1997. Japanese Jaguars and Japanese guitars. Uh, well, Japanese offsets have a host of different problems because of manufacturing differences, blah, blah, blah. I won't get into it. But I didn't know how to set my Jaguar up. I saw there's a shim in the neck pocket, and I was like, oh, this probably shouldn't be here. And took it out, and my guitar never played great again. And I was, I was once a stymied, consternated guitar player, just like other people who have owned them. Uh, but I think, I think the real problem is just a lack of information. I think that's the real issue with these guitars. So, so yeah, I... Uh, I earned the nickname probably because I talk about them way too much and I get way too excited about them just like I just did. I'm pacing in my apartment, my hands. I'm gesticulating wildly <laughs> because I'm so excited <laughs> about these guitars. So yeah, uh, as I always say, like, hell yes, buy a Mastery Bridge because I love them. Woody's awesome. Uh, that team has created a product that I think has given a new life to these instruments. But that original bridge can, can make you happy. And a bunch of surf players would probably back me up on that, too. Um, yeah, no kidding. So, sorry I went off. 
Hey, I asked yeah. the question and I got the answer. That's cool. <gasps> that's what the whole point of this is. Oh god, you got such a long answer. <laughs> I love it. I, uh, I really do. That's great. Yeah. So yeah, I've, I talked about this on the first episode, but I I've had a a vintage Jazzmaster on the list for a while and dude, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, for several years, and I you know and I there for a while had the had the money set aside for it. Um, oh really? Yeah, and I was just waiting for the right one to come along, mm. and um, and then then a Tele Custom came along. Uh, <sighs> uh, real quick, I when I bought this Sonic Blue Jazzmaster, I had um, what was it? A Sunburst Tele Custom from Wildwood Guitars. I had one on hold for me. I had a, a down deposit and everything, so I get that. Bound yeah. Telecasters are the sexiest things ever. Oh, this this is actually the not that. This oh, this is, is a, a non-bound one. Yeah, this is the 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 seventies um, oh, one with the uh, wide yeah. ranger in the neck. Nice. Um, oh, and yes, bound tellies are about one of the most gorgeous things. But that's that's a nice. whole other that's a whole other story. This is an unbound one. Um, rosewood neck. It's mm. black. Rad. Um, and, what, what is uh, it? Is it a reissue? Is it a vintage one? It's a '74. Oh god, yeah. Oh, that's a good year too. Oh man, I'm so jealous. And Love I, those I, I started. I, I shouldn't tell the story again, but I'm going to tell it again anyway because you <laughs> haven't heard it. So, <laughs> I was headed to. We, we were out with a drummer, um, looking for his first drum set. Kind of sounds funny. Uh, he played electric drums and. And oh, we, were wow. going in, we were going into the album, we were going in to record our album, and uh, he needed a real drum set. So we were shopping for a drum set, and I said, hey, I want to stop over here at uh, uh, this this guitar shop real quick. They have a telly I'm curious about. I've seen it hmm. online. And I went in and played it, and there's there's two other guitar players in the band. We all played it, and I was like, good thing I brought the money. This baby's <laughs> coming home, because this thing is amazing. But, wow. Wow. Uh, yeah, and then I I bought it, and I don't like I said I don't regret buying it um, because it's an amazing guitar. But there went the Jazzmaster fund, and I'm trying hey, to build that back up. That so. happens. You uh, you know you know what it is is like uh, like I always tell customers um, when they're th- concerned about things like color, like yeah, color totally, you know, it definitely matters. Color, uh, finish, style, like all those things are just as important as how the guitar plays to some people, and so. But I always tell them, like, you know, prepare yourself because you could walk into a guitar shop and you might hate the color blue, but you're going to go, oh, I'll just try this one since that's the one they have. And if it blows your mind and if it's the best playing one you've ever played, well, guess what? You love the color blue all of a sudden. Like, you just, mm-hmm. it looks like you like blue guitars now. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you wanted a Jazz Master. You found an amazing Telecaster. That's a great way to go. I actually, yeah. I really miss having a wide range pickup in my life. So, I'm I'm I immensely love that jealous. Thing. I I love that thing so much. The it, I can't even tell you how much I love that middle position. Mm-hmm. Roll the roll the bucker down just a little bit volume wise, and it's the prettiest yeah. clean tone. I've, yeah, I've ever heard. Oh um, man, those are so great, man. <sighs> Congrats! So, Congrats! Well, thank you, thank you. So, but you're the perfect guy to ask. So my my visually my perfect um my perfect jazz master was on craigslist in portland when i didn't have the money oh what was that um, it was a 63 mm. um that had been and this is ironically i'm not looking at this from a collector perspective so this is what i want it was a white refin over a burst mhm that has that it was obviously an old refin and had been worn in just just such ways that the, <laughs> the, 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 that the sunburst was poking through in oh. just the right manner in certain spots, and I did not have the money to get it. Man, and, I love color over color or color over burst refinishes. Even Fender did that back in the '60s. They would, if they screwed up a sunburst and they they had somebody that wanted like a Fiesta red, well, guess what? They would just spray right over the burst and. It's it's like a it's like a it's like a Christmas surprise every time you find a vintage guitar with a tiny nick on it and you go wait that's not wood that's that's red what's going on here like yeah mm-hmm. 
that's the coolest thing ever. Even if it's a crappy refin, that's still pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a Jaguar on Reverb.com right now that they they're asking a little too much money, in my humble opinion. But it is uh, it's like a Lake Placid blue over candy apple red. Oh and, man. Uh, oh. God, the things I want to sell for that that I probably won't. Yeah. Uh, that thing would be perfect. It's like a 65 and, uh, and uh, presumably the whole original finish is underneath that really crappy blue overspray. But, oh, uh, man. Yeah, I totally get that. And I'm sorry you didn't have the money for that because that would have been really fun. I think um, even if you're, if, you, if you're looking at it as a collector's thing... I get that, but if you just want a cool guitar, there's absolutely nothing wrong with going for refins. Like at the shop, we may we may uh, you know buy them for a lot less because they are they are honestly from collector's standpoint less desirable. But we've had some refin Jaguars and Jazzmasters lately that just blew minds all over the place. Uh, there's no reason to ever shy away from them, even if it's poorly done, because you can always pay somebody to do it better. Um, right. You yes. know. So. I would, I would totally be thrilled personally right now to find a Jag, uh, for like a thousand bucks that's been just hacked to death. Like I would love to find one with humbucker routes, uh, sprayed the worst color ever by someone in their basement. Like totally fine with me because I would, I'd be able to take that and turn it into my dream Jaguar. Um, yeah, so that, I'm always looking out for that stuff. But yeah, dude, refins, oh, refins are great. It's a great like way to get into a vintage guitar and not spend too much money. Well, it's so. kind of funny because it's not even, even if I had the money for something more original, that I actually want that. I want mm -hmm. a refin. I, I specifically would like the Alpine White over, or not Alpine White, Olympic White over the Burst. Mm -hmm. As soon as I seen that, I, I, I was like, that's what I want. And, that is and glorious. I, I still want that so bad. Like, I would take that over a pristine original at this point. Yeah, I, man. I just, I don't know why. It's it's a weird thing, but that's that's where I'm at right now. I don't think it's that weird. It seems like, you know, a guitar like that fulfills your dream. And that's that's not weird at all. That's perfect. I, uh, and plus, you won't even have to worry about, like, beating it up a little bit. You can just... You just play the hell out of that guitar, and it's it's going to be fine no matter what you do to it because it's already been mucked with, uh, arguably irreparably, by somebody else. So yeah, yeah exactly. That's great. That's fantastic. Um, my my dream guitar is uh, one that we call Pancake, uh, thanks to the guitar strap that uh, Paul Frank made for me. But it's a 1961 Jazzmaster, mm -hmm. uh, totally original. You've probably seen it on Instagram because I talk about it all the time. Uh, yeah, I've posted that a couple times. Ugh, uh, more than a couple. Oh my god, <laughs> best best jazz master I've ever played in my life, and I get to own it. Haven't completely paid it off yet, but it'll be in my hands sometime soon. I'm sure. Oh, you you are getting it. Oh, ah, uh, yeah. You oh, your my heart is all a flutter right now. Oh, thank you. It's... I'm just remembering a couple months ago when it, that wasn't the case, and now I'm so happy. I'm yeah, so happy. I'm super happy. Uh, luckily, I. This is a weird story, but before I left Seattle to move to Long Beach, California, my wife and I were given, I think, four sets of bagpipes by a friend of ours, uh, and which I, I really wanted to learn. And it turns out I am I am horrible. I thought my Scottish heritage would carry me through. I was going to say you uh, look like a piper. Yeah, it, it turns out that my ancestors didn't want that happening. I was terrible at it, so I sold them all, and I ended up making almost enough money to pay for half the guitar. So it's... I'm still a ways away, and I still have to figure out where the other two grand is coming from. But, like, I, I, have, I have it partly paid off. My buddy Jake is the greatest person in the world for keeping it so many years uh, and now selling it back to me. So I'm working on it. It's, uh, you know, we're tightening our belts over here, but uh, getting it back. But, uh, yeah, that's the greatest guitar in the world. I cannot wait to have it back in my stead. So That is, that is so, yeah. so awesome. So so oh I'm so happy like thanks I was, man I was honest I was bummed I was bummed for a while like oh, I'm, he's not gonna get it oh <sighs> uh, okay. well that means I'm so glad that other people were following that and feeling cool about it so thanks for <laughs> thanks for that man I'm really excited I can't wait to have it back that's awesome oh yeah. that's that's great yeah well huh this has been a very a very awesome <laughs> and all over the place discussion but, yeah uh, man. 
I uh, I have a feeling. I yes, we are are nearing the end of our hour, um, or actually we're over it a little bit. And uh, <laughs> as, and uh, as <coughs> this is this is this is not unusual. This is this has happened every episode, and I say this to every guest. We could go on like this all night. Oh yeah, I, I, I promise. And and uh, but yeah, and you know what? People are already at work by now. They've shut it off. They're in their cubicles, <laughs> typing away, drooling over jazz masters, and uh, and they'll listen to something else when they get back in the car and go home. So <laughs> we, we probably better uh, better uh, cut it off. And I sure. think we're gonna have to pick this up again sometime because I think so this too. was a really epic talk. So, well, fantastic! Seriously, thank you for asking me to be a part of this. I'm so excited to be. Uh, you know, uh, interviewed and, uh, to speak to, uh, the tone mob, who was you. Um, yeah. Thank you for having me on. This has been a huge pleasure and, uh, I cannot wait to do it again someday. So yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Michael. Uh, I will uh, be posting, uh, in the show notes, links to Michael Mike's guitar bar, your Instagram page, anything else you would like me to put in there. We'll talk about that. All right. Uh, as always, everyone, um, this is Blake Wyland for Michael James, and good luck and good tones. Hey, thanks, Blake. Yep, talk to you later. Bye. All right, brother. Later. One last thing before we totally sign off here. I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? Again, the link for that is tonemob.com slash stringjoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple, and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstory as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gun Street harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunStreetWiringShop.com and check them out.